Hello, uh, welcome to another pro virtual program with Maine Historical Society. My name is Kathleen Newman. It is November 29th, 2022. And this is our book talk on skirts, fashioning modern femininity in the 20th century with Dr. Kimberly Crispin Campbell. Uh, Dr. Kimberly Crispin Campbell is an award-winning fashion historian, curator, and journalist based in Los Angeles. She's the writer of Fashion Victims, Dress at the Court of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, Worn on This Day, The Clothes That Made History, The Way We Wed, A Global History of Wedding Fashion, Red, White, and Blue on the Runway, the 1968 White House Fashion Show and the Politics of American Style, and uh, her latest publication, the subject of our discussion tonight, Skirts, Fashioning Modern Femininity in the 20th Century. And she's written about fashion, art, and culture for a variety of pub publications, The Atlantic, Washington Post, Political Slate, and the Wall Street Journal, and has appeared on NPR, the Biography Channel, and Reels, and uh, several podcasts. She was a 2020 uh, 21 NEH Public Scholar and a 2021 22 USC Libraries Fellow, as well as writing books and articles. Uh, she also does writing, lecturing, curating, and consulting for museums, universities, and the entertainment industry. Uh, Kimberly, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Thank you for inviting me, Kathleen. It's great to be here. Our pleasure. Well, I want to say good evening to everyone else and good afternoon if you're on the West Coast, as I am. I'm very happy to be here to celebrate part two of Northern Threads and to discuss my most recent book, Skirt, published by St. Martin's Press and now available in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook from your favorite bookseller. I'm going to share my screen. Well, since the late Middle Ages, when men stopped wearing long robes uh, and started wearing short doublets and hose, skirts have been synonymous with femininity in Western culture. And critiques of women's fashion have often served as thinly veiled attacks on women themselves, disparaging their perceived frivolity, vanity, or sexual immorality. They were verbally linked too, as skirts became slang for women beginning in the 16th century. A womanizer was a skirt chaser. A light skirt might allow herself to be caught. Women in positions of power were belittled as a petticoat government. And to be treated as an inferior was to be petticoated, just as wearing the pants suggested a woman usurping male power or privilege. There is sometimes a tendency to see skirts and dresses as old fashioned or even oppressive, but that wasn't necessarily true in the 19th century when these bustled styles from part one of the Northern Thread exhibition were worn. And it's certainly not true today, as I hope you'll agree by the end of this talk. Yet women continue to be defined by their dresses well into the 20th century. If you wanted to make a bathroom or a cartoon animal female, you put a skirt on it. And it's only very recently and very contentiously that that's begun to change. The 1952 movie musical Skirts Ahoy followed the amorous adventures of three Navy waves, an acronym denoting women accepted for volunteer emergency service. On the right are some real Navy waves whose Chic ship-shaped uniform was designed by Chicago-born Couturier Mamboche in 1942. As late as 1986, the Beastie Boys celebrated skirt chasing on License to Ill, the first rap album to hit number one on the Billboard chart. Of course, by 1986, it was perfectly acceptable for women to wear pants. Or was it? The conventional narrative that women won the freedom to dress as they pleased, along with the rights to vote, work, join the military, and have bank accounts and credit cards in their own names, something that didn't happen until 1974, doesn't really hold up historically. It was only in the late 1970s that most restaurants, schools, and workplaces reluctantly allowed women to wear pants. Some banks, law firms, and airlines banned female employees from wearing pants until the 1990s or much later. 
2016 for British Airways and Alitalia flight attendants, 2020 for Japan Airlines and Aer Lingus. Women in pants were banned from the floor of the United States Senate until 1993. A French law against women wearing pants passed in 1800 wasn't formally overturned until 2013. Even when these institutions grudgingly permitted slack, jeans, shorts, and culottes remained firmly forbidden. So any historian of 20th century fashion or feminism must contend with skirts and resist the temptation to characterize them as inferior to pants in terms of comfort, utility, or modernity. Suffragettes and soldiers marched in skirts. Athletes and explorers scaled new heights of physical endurance in skirts. The heroines of the civil rights movement, Rosa Parks, six of the Little Rock Nine, the Bloody Sunday marchers in their church clothes, they all took a stand in skirts. Frida Kahlo and Georgia O'Keeffe revolutionized modern art in skirts. Marie Curie won two Nobel Prizes in skirts. When NASA put a man on the moon, the computer wore a skirt, in the words of one of those computers, mathematician Katherine G. Johnson. Serena Williams won most of her 23 grand slams in skirts. I included a whole chapter on tennis skirts in the book because debates over women's fashion and bodies have always played out on the tennis court. Tennis is one of the oldest sports played by women, and it has been co-ed and skirted from day one. French tennis champion Suzanne Langlin on the right revolutionized the sport in 1920 when she made her Wimbledon debut wearing short sleeves and a Catholic skirt, an outfit the press called indecent. And you can see why when you compare her to Queen Mary in this 1926 photo wearing what was then considered decent dress. But by this time, it was the young athlete and not the venerable queen who was the fashion influencer. In the same year, 1926, Wharton economist George Taylor proposed his hemline index, the theory that rising and falling hemlines predict the direction of a stock market. While that proved to be a fallacy, Hemlines are often reliable indicators of changing lifestyles and moral standards. And while tennis no longer drives hemlines up, many women's tennis stars, including Langland and Williams, have served as fashion plates off the court as well as on, even dabbling in fashion and textile design. I was so happy with the way books and papers turned out. This reproduces a dress fabric designed for the Skelly Silks Corporation by Helen Wills Moody, the American tennis player and fashion icon who racked up 31 Grand, Grand Slam tournament wins in the 1920s and 30s, as well as being an accomplished artist. Some of the skirts and dresses in my book have been around for a very long time, but their names or appearances have changed dramatically over the decades which is why it's so important for historians to go back to contemporaneous eyewitness sources whenever possible. Terminology evolves along with fashion, and we all bring survivorship bias to the study of clothing because we all still wear it. When you and I think of a little black dress, we probably picture something short and sexy like the Hervé Leger bandage dress that Cindy Crawford wears on the left. But Coco Chanel's original little black dress of 1926 on the right was neither short nor sexy. What was truly radical about it was its simplicity and its somber, if practical, color previously associated with mourning. Elaborate mourning dress and rituals fell out of use during World War II. It was considered wasteful and bad for morale. Vogue called Chanel's creation a Ford among dresses. Like the Model T, it was reliable, affordable, and it only came in one color, black. The naked dress is another style that's still with us today, but has a long and surprising history. When Manboche first introduced strapless gowns in 1934 on the left, they were called naked dresses. These marvels of engineering seemed to stay in place only by a miracle as one fashion reporter observed. 
Just as perceptions of the little black dress evolved over time, these early strapless gowns were considered high tech, luxurious and sophisticated rather than sexy. They demanded perfect posture, beautiful shoulders and arms, a couture budget and exquisite jewelry. They quickly became associated with high society debutantes like Brenda Fraser at the center, whom the term celebutante was first coined. These privileged young women were constantly photographed in evening gowns, and they had the bodies and budgets to pull off the strapless look. But the strapless craze came to a premature end thanks to World War II, when fabric for long full skirts became scarce, along with the metal used for the boning required to support strapless bodices. It wasn't until after the war that fashion rediscovered the silhouette and sales surged with a boost from Rita Hayworth. In the 1946 film, Gilda, Hayworth sang and danced in a strapless black satin Jean-Louis gown. She paired it with long black satin gloves that ended right at the neckline, visually extending the expanse of shoulder and bosom on display. The gown's form-fitting skirt slit to the thigh, bared even more. When Hayworth threw her arms over her head without losing her top, she gave women everywhere the confidence to go strapless. A similar sartorial sleight of hand gave us the naked dress as we know it today. But the sheer sparkly dresses worn by mid-century actresses and cabaret singers like Marilyn Monroe and Marlena Dietrich on the left were originally called illusion dresses, not naked dresses, because they gave the illusion of nudity. The sheer skin tone fabric disappeared under stage light, making it look like the wearer was clad in nothing but jewels or sequins. But it was only an illusion. These gowns didn't actually bear any body parts. They just made you look twice. The modern usage of the term naked dress can be dated to an early episode of Sex in the City, in which Sarah Jessica Parker wore this short backless Donna Karen slip dress, which is skimpy, but hardly gives the illusion of nudity. Its hue is the matte putty color of an ace bandage rather than the glowing rose gold of actress Sarah Jessica Parker's skin. It's a slip dress and cut, but also in the sense that it's that same uncanny valley nude tone of a mass produced foundation garment. It doesn't mimic nudity so much as underwear. Today, naked dress can mean anything sheer, skin toned or skin tight, or preferably all of the above. That includes the plunging Versace dress that Jennifer Lopez wore to the 2000 Grammy Awards. This is the dress that launched Google Images and it raised the bar for red carpet style. More than a decade before Instagram, it prefigured the role of social media in setting fashion trends and spreading sexy photos. It's no wonder that the naked dress became a red carpet mainstay as Rihanna demonstrates on the right. Thanks to the rise of the step and repeat, a temporary wall plastered with sponsor logos that came into use in the early 2000s, as well as instantaneous uploading to social media, the red carpet has become a digital billboard and the naked dress is the perfect clickbait. Walking a fine line between exposure and overexposure, it requires only one accessory, naked confidence. Another style to come out of World War II was the so-called new look, a phrase coined by Harper's Bazaar editor Carmel Snow to describe Christian Dior's 1947 debut collection. I'm showing you the bar suit, which has become the iconic new look ensemble, but the entire collection featured these hourglass silhouettes, rounded shoulders, and long full skirts. Women who had grown accustomed to Rosie the Riveter coveralls hand-me-downs and managed military uniforms with square shoulders and slim knee-length skirts during the war were enchanted. Not only did the generous yardage signal a reprieve from wartime deprivations and fabric restrictions, but the new look symbolized the return of celebration and socializing, including going to bars for cocktails dressed like this. You can draw a lot of parallels with our current post-pandemic fashion moment and the maximalist party-ready styles that we're seeing in magazines and on the red carpet. 
One of the most surprising skirts in my book is the poodle skirt. Rather than the quintessential 1950s fashion statement, the poodle skirt was a novelty worn by grown women for two years at most, roughly 1952 to 54, before being consigned to the children's department and thence to the dustbin of history. But its innate provincialism and fleeting lifespan belie the complex history of the statement skirt, born of long-standing American stereotypes about French culture, combined with excitement over the new textiles and full-skirted silhouettes coming out of post-war Paris. Before the war, poodles were already synonymous with Frenchness in the US, with all the style and sophistication that implied. Though they were not a French breed, poodles were often called French poodles, since trained poodles had long been part of the French court and circus entertainment. The animal's elaborate haircuts, too, may have suggested a typically French strain of arrogant chic. However, the poodle in poodle skirt referred to its fabric, not its couture cut or canine applique. Poodle cloth or poilu, meaning hairy in French, was a stiff, fuzzy textile used for coats and suits, as well as skirts after the war. It resembled industrial carpeting more than dog fur. And as you can see from the ad on the right, it was used for straight poodle skirts as well as full skirts. But its precise combination of lightness and stiffness made it ideal for bringing the hourglass silhouette of Christian Dior's new look to the American mass market. It did not take long for an enterprising manufacturer to make the connection between poodle cloth and actual poodles and decorate all that yardage with appliques of dogs and other motifs. But these pictorial circle skirts grew so popular so fast that the fad faded just as quickly. What comes into fashion must go out of fashion. Fashion tends to cycle between extremes and the long full skirts of the 50s inevitably gave way to the mini skirt. Once again though, the mini had a much different meaning in 1964 than it does today. While certainly shocking, it was never intended to be sexy. It was about innocence, not experience. It was always worn with flats or low heels. And it looked like something you could buy in the children's department with simple a-line silhouettes, bows, ruffles, floral and polka dot prints, and Peter Pan collars. Teenage supermodel Twiggy, who you see here, had enormous eyes with painted on eyelashes that gave the impression of a doll or a little girl playing dress up in her mother's clothes. She was frequently photographed in cartoonishly oversized mini dresses and Mary Janes, sucking on lollipops, or playing with bicycles, swings, jump ropes, and balloons, as we see here. Vogue described her lack of sophistication and conceit, limited vocabulary, and very sweet nature, saying, in other, any other decade, these things would have combined to prevent Twiggy's becoming a success, not anymore. The miniskirt's power and danger lay not in what it revealed, but in what it represented. Like Twiggy, it represented youth itself. The post-war baby boom had created a youth quake. By the mid 60s, roughly 40% of the American and British population were under 25. And they looked even younger thanks to slim figures born of wartime austerity. They were a powerful cultural and economic demographic and the fashion industry reshaped itself around their taste. Teenage girls had once aspired to look grown up and sophisticated. Now, from high heels, long skirts, and girdles, they were emancipated both physically and socially. That freedom translated easily to utopian science fiction, which had long envisioned women as valued crew members on space missions, often wearing unfashionably short skirts. The first woman in space, Soviet cosmonaut Valentina Tereshkova took flight in 1963, wearing a unisex blue jumpsuit, not a miniskirt. 
But couturier Andre Courage looked to fictional female astronauts for inspiration for his Moon Girl collection of April 1964, which featured helmet-shaped hats, metallic jumpsuits, minis, and flat-soled moon boots. Courage believed that fashion had failed women, saying, you don't walk through life anymore. You run, you dance, you drive a car, you take a plane. Clothes must be able to move too. Mini skirts didn't just bear women's legs, they liberated them. In 1966, the USS Enterprise took flight with a mini skirted chief communications officer, Lieutenant Uhura. Actress Michelle Nichols remembered in her autobiography that in later years, especially as the women's movement took hold in the 70s, people began to ask me about my costume. Some thought it demeaning for a woman in the command crew to be dressed so sexily. Contrary to what many may think today, no one saw it as demeaning back then. In fact, the miniskirt was a symbol of sexual liberation. More to the point, in the 23rd century, you are respected for your abilities, regardless of what you do or do not wear. As the 1960s spiraled into social and political chaos, women's headlines careened from mini to maxi, hitting every length in between. Some women found fashion's infinite variety freeing. Others were frustrated by its constant ups and downs. A compromise emerged in the form of Theodora Van Runkel's costumes for the 1967 film Bonnie and Clyde on the left the story of real depression era bank robbers on the right. Faye Dunaway's instantly iconic berets, clinging sweaters, and calf-length skirts in earthy shades and textures proved an irresistible alternative to micro minis and synthetic fabrics and day glow colors. Far from saccharine nostalgia, the so-called midi length represented gritty glamor for fashion outlaws. The fact that most men hated it only made it more attractive to liberated women determined to resist conventional standards of beauty. The midi leg divided the nation. Fashion journalists loved it and the fashion industry invested heavily in it. But many women found it old fashioned and unflattering. The warring interests of consumers, retailers and the fashion press culminated in what Newsweek called the midi skirt debacle of 1970, as frustrated shoppers staged nationwide protests against the midi. Far from selling skirts, yo-yoing hemlines eroded consumer confidence in the fashion industry and replaced it with a rebellious cynicism. The only real victor to emerge from what women's wear daily dubbed the hemline war was pants which for many women provided an attractive and suitably feminist alternative to minis, maxis, and midis. As the designer Halston told the New York Times in 1971, pants give women the freedom to move around they've never had before. They don't have to worry about getting into low furniture or low sports cars. Pants will be with us for many years to come, probably forever, if you can make that statement in fashion. His words proved to be prophetic. However, at a time when many women were still banned from wearing pants in public places, they were not quite as practical as Halston implied. When Dionne von Furstenberg de debuted her knee-length wrap dress in 1974, women embraced the comfort and convenience of the easy care, easy to wear, go anywhere garment, which managed to be feminist and feminine at the same time. As the number of women in college and white collar careers surged in the 1970s, the power suit offered them office appropriate attire and embodied women's newfound socioeconomic power. Though it often had masculine styling and details like pinstripes, pocket squares, and notch lapels, the stereotypical power suit was a brightly colored or patterned skirt suit and often a short, tight skirt at that, equipped with slit for ease of movement at the back. The New Yorker's fashion critic Kennedy Fraser observed in 1979, the traditional business uniform of men continues in favor, 
not only because of conservatism, but because it is eminently practical. It is a style of dress that can be forgotten about while the people wearing it devote their attention to the job at hand. Adapted for women, however, the man's suit gains triviality and becomes something like a costume for a role, Fraser complained. Many of the new fashions for young executive women somehow imply a playing at careerism. Unlike its practical, anonymous, masculine counterpart, the eye-catching power suit demanded to be the center of attention. Moose hair, shoulder pads, and high heels physically enlarged its wearer. Instead of a successful woman, it too often suggested an unsuccessful imitation of a man. For a second wave feminist like Hillary Clinton, power came to mean wearing the pants both literally and metaphorically by inserting themselves into male dominated spaces and spheres in pantsuits that were more practical and anonymous than their costumey 1980s counterparts without being identical to menswear. That accomplished, however, women of the 21st century have pursued a different kind of sartorial liberation, the freedom to wear whatever they want. In 2021, Congresswoman Stacey Plaskett won praise from political pundits and style gurus alike when she prosecuted Donald Trump's second impeachment wearing a show-stopping caped dress in Democratic blue, paired with high heels that added inches to her already statuesque six-foot frame. Social media likened her to a superhero defending democracy. Her clothing didn't overshadow her performance, it underlined and enhanced it. Plaskett proved that you don't need to wear a pantsuit or a power suit to look powerful, professional, and pulled together. A message that resonated especially with younger women who don't remember a time when wearing pants was a controversial right to be won. We've progressed beyond the idea that women have to dress like men to compete with them. Today, pants are an option, but they're not the only option. They're not the only option for men either. Terms like unisex and androgynous have historically been applied to masculine garments adopted by women and rarely the reverse. But there was no suggestion of David Bowie style androgyny when Kurt Cobain appeared on the cover of the British fashion magazine, The Face, wearing a floral dress in 1993. It was the stark contrast between his male and female attributes, rather than the artful blurring of boundaries, that made the image compelling and controversial. Men have worn skirts in many cultures for many centuries. Part of the reason men's skirts are more visible and accepted today is the resurgence of nationalism and ethnic pride in the face of rapid globalization, expressed by wearing traditional or regional garments, as Tongan Olympian Pita Tafatafua had, has memorably demonstrated. In recent years, though, Western fashion has caught up, thanks to evolving social, legal, and medical conceptions of gender. High profile non binary and transgender celebrities and models have become fashion icons, even as they remain political hot buttons. In retail and advertising, the more flexible and open ended terms gender neutral and gender inclusive have replaced the monolithic unisex. And even the traditional restroom signage has gotten a fashion makeover. When Harry Styles appeared on the cover of the December 2020 issue of Vogue, becoming the first man to do so, his black tuxedo jacket came from Gucci's menswear collection and his gray lace evening gown from the women's wear collection. Tellingly though, Vogue simply identified both as Gucci. There is no more menswear or women's wear, it implied. There is only fashion. If we take a closer look at this landmark spread titled Playtime, I think there's a very interesting parallel with another key moment of fashion rebirth. Notice the bikes 
the balloons, the sense of playing dress up in someone else's oversized clothes. What does this remind you of? It's Twiggy reborn in potentially controversial fashions that are consciously characterized as playful rather than provocative. Styles is quoted in the article as saying, clothes are there to have fun with and experiment with and play with. Once you remove any gender barriers, obviously you can open up the arena in which you can play. There's just so much joy to be had in playing with clothes. That's a theme that resonates throughout my book, whether it's stories of the jaded fashion editors who stayed behind after Dior's debut show to twirl around in his decadently long knife pleated skirt, or little girls playing at being Disney princesses in Halloween costumes that get worn year round. Women have continued wearing skirts, even as pants have become increasingly available to them for many reasons social, economic, and aesthetic. But let's not discount their haptic pleasures from the central swish and swirl of a full skirt to the freedom of a mini or the satisfying constraint of a pencil skirt, a hobble skirt, or a bodycon dress. Pants may be with us forever as Halston predicted, but they haven't replaced skirts and I for one hope they never will. Thank you so much for listening. I would like to invite you to follow me on your preferred social media, and I'd be happy to take questions from the chat. Thank you so much. Uh, really interesting. Um, I'm going to open the questions by asking what inspired you to write this book? Well, there's sort of a fake history of costume that I think we're all aware of if we've, if we've seen uh, television and movie dramas set in the past. And there's this narrative that you know, the, the tomboy or the progressive woman or the liberated woman wears pants. And we see this even in kind of the live action Beauty and the Beast. Um, this is not- She's, uh, she's not anyway. like other girls that, yeah. <laughs> she's not like other girls. Yeah. And you mm -hmm. can tell because she's wearing pants. And that's not strictly accurate. And I, I wanted to kind of push back on that conventional wisdom and this sort of fake history of costume um, be, because it, it was very hard for women to get away with wearing pants in a lot of settings. Um, the women who did wear pants, I mean, everybody talks about, oh, Coco Chanel or Catherine Hepburn. Um, they were outliers and they were, for the most part, very rich women uh, who not only had the social clout to sort of buck convention, but who also had their pants custom made by their husband's tailors in many cases, because you couldn't buy them off the rack. And even in the 50s, when pants were, were becoming more acceptable for leisure wear, uh, Vogue was printing articles saying, well, if you weigh more than 120 pounds, you should probably avoid this style. Uh, they, they were very much considered something that you wore in the country at your country house uh, and something that you had to be very, very petite to wear. Mm. Someone in the audience is asking, um, can you tell us more about women in pants being banned from the U.S. Senate floor in the 90s, which just seems today so crazy. I know it seems crazy. And they also banned women uh, from wearing um, sleeveless dresses, too. That's, that's a whole different <laughs> controversy. Of course, many women did try to wear pants and, and they they would kind of sneak in with them and and there, were, there was a lot of boundary pushing uh, long before 1993 when the ban was lifted, but that law did remain on the books. Uh, there's a great story in my book about Shirley Chisholm, who was uh, the first woman to run for president. She was a, a congresswoman and very stylish. She designed and, uh, all her own clothes and sort of had, had a dressmaker make them up for her. Uh, and she, even though she was so such a radical feminist and such a, a trailblazer, she felt very uncomfortable in pants. She she might wear them off duty, but her staff who were kind of younger and hipper uh, tried to get her to wear them to work. And they, she wore them once uh, to work at the Capitol with sort of a long coat over them. And the story is that she was so uncomfortable that she kind of hid behind the New York Times all day and nobody nobody saw what she was wearing because she, she just, even though she was such a a uh, trailblazer in other ways. There, there was this social taboo, and and I think a kind of a personal taboo against wearing something that was considered very casual and and for very very young women. 
What about um, bloomers? Where do they fit into this history? Yeah, uh, Amelia Bloomer uh, gave her name to the bloomer costume. It was also called the freedom dress. And uh, the bloomer costume lasted uh, not even as long as the hoop petticoat. It, <laughs> it, it, it made a big impression in fashion history, not, not as long as the, uh, the uh, poodle skirt, excuse me. It, it, it's very famous. We all know what it is. We all talk about it. But it was actually only worn for you know, a year and a bit um, because there was so much pushback against it. And a lot of the early feminists like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton tried it out. Um, they liked the idea, they wore it in public and they got such a, a, a kind of horrifying reaction uh, that they gave it up very quickly. Uh, not just because they kind of felt uh, that their own safety was at risk, but because they realized it was a distraction from their cause. Right. And they didn't right. want people to focus on what they were wearing and see them as the sort of she-males that uh, had to be, um, you know, sort of uh, driven out of society. Sure. They, they wanted to give their movement respectability. Uh, they wanted it to be considered something that, that you wouldn't mind your wife or your daughter getting involved with. Right. And in retrospect, that was definitely the right call. So how do we explain like something like that, like bloomers that like it, it sticks so much in the public memory or poodle skirts. I mean, I remember when I was a kid in the nineties, like early nineties, Girl Scout dances. It's a 1950s dance. Yeah. It was all about the poodle yeah. skirt. Our, you know, our mothers were born in that era. And to them, that was, that was the fifties. They put us all in poodle skirts, but it, according, you know, to your research, that sounds like a real flash in the pan. So why does that like, why does it, why do those things stick with us so much? Well, I, I think the poodle skirt was part of a larger trend towards longer, fuller skirts. Mm -hmm. um, those certainly got worn, but the actual skirt with a poodle on it, um, not so much. Uh, it, it is a very eye-catching skirt, obviously. It was much photographed at the time. Uh, like the bloomer costume, it looms very large in history, even though it, it actually played a very small part. And yeah, I think uh, movies and TV have lied to us for, for a long time about the poodle skirts, <laughs> among other things. Uh, they're, they're extremely rare. I mean, uh, uh, the uh, most of the ones that I know that survive in museum collections are for children. Um, and if you talk to people who you know remember the fifties well, you know they'll tell you they they never saw them. Well, yeah, yeah, and I think that I think you have really hit on something there when you talk about how we imagine the past it's so influenced by media by mm -hmm. entertainment do you have a particular as you know a, a, a costume historian and as someone who consults uh in the entertainment world do you have like a favorite like oh this movie or this particular television show really gets it right uh yeah i i, I love a room with a view i think that's Still holds up really well. Um, they used a lot of historic pieces in that movie. Um, uh, uh, Dangerous Liaisons is one of my favorites, although um, costume designers don't like it, interestingly. And part of the reason is because everybody looks like they just stepped out of a fashion plate. And mm -hmm. that's not costuming. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I've kind of come to terms with the fact that, that movie costumes aren't supposed to be documentary history right. level actors. <laughs> Um, they do have to do other work, like creating a color palette or creating character or, you know, advancing the narrative. And sometimes they just need to look good to modern audiences, sure. which at, at a realistic. I mean, the know, thing, like, not. the thing for me that, oh, it, it's like the hair and the makeup are always what give it, you know, it's amazing how you watch a television show and you're like, yeah, I know this is set, supposed to be set in the 1860s, but it's so obvious that it was made in the 1960s because, to appeal to that palette, that the hair, the you know, the the way they're all really styled, um, is very much of the era in which the film or the show is made. Exactly, and it's also about the actors. You don't want to put a movie star in your movie and then make them unrecognizable with with historically accurate, hair. <laughs> right? With that Victorian <laughs> part, that right down the middle and the curls on either side. Um, someone's asking, what can you tell us about the role of uh, jeans um, denim for women? Yeah, um, I mean, that, that uh, again, kind of speaks to the, the very casual nature of um, 
of the pants in general. Uh, there was a big dude ranch movement starting in, in the 30s and 40s where a lot of people went to dude ranches on vacation. And you bought a new wardrobe for that trip because you didn't have jeans and plaid shirts necessarily in your home wardrobe. So that that was a, a time when a lot of women were buying jeans for these very specific uh, trips and, and places. Um, and, you know, jeans, of course, uh, started out as workwear during the gold rush. They were worn by miners. Uh, now they're very expensive. Now they're, you know, designed by by very high end designers and and we wear them you know out out at night <laughs> for for parties and and to events um so that's a really good example of how casual wear becomes more and more formal over time and and we see that happening with pants too pants for women was once something you wore in your garden in the country in the suburbs um you know never in an office or a restaurant or a formal situation and that's of course, change very, very dramatically. I know when I think about like one of the big differences, like when I'm looking at our exhibit Northern Threads or just at old photographs, you know, family photographs, I feel like the change that I feel like I notice the most is in general, everything just feels like it's become more casual. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you think that that's true or that, or, and if so, like what, um, what is that? What can that shift tell us? Like, why don't we um, mow the lawn in like a suit anymore? <laughs> but we also don't. Why don't we go on an airplane in a suit. Right. We, that was, again, when I was like a kid, like 1989, like my mother bought outfits for our plane ride. You know, it was the first time my sister and I were going to be on a plane. And these are the outfits that you're going to wear on a plane. And now, you know, if I got on a plane, like probably like my yoga <laughs> pants and my sneakers or, you know, who cares? What, what, what is that shift? Well, it's not just you. That's something that's been happening for centuries. Um, the, the arc of fashion bends towards informality. And we are always, um, I think, too, being influenced by sports and by, by physical activity, uh, as well as technology, you know, new, new fabrics and new, new kinds of closures like zippers um, and things like Velcro, you know, all, always make fashion easier to wear, easier to, to create. Um, so that that's not a new thing. It's been happening forever. I mean, most most men, the most formal thing they will ever wear is a tuxedo, mm -hmm. but the tuxedo was an informal alternative to white tie and tails when it was right, first. Right. <laughs> uh, nobody wears white tie and tails anymore unless you're going to a, a royal banquet, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another question. Um, how has your uh, research about, about bridal wear dovetail with skirt research? Um, do you see parallels there or are they very different? That, well, that's been fascinating. I, I never wanted to write about bridal wear because I thought it, it really doesn't have a lot to do with fashion. You know, it's very traditional and very, you know, formal. It's sort of its own thing. Um, that's not really true, though. Um, when I wrote The Way We Wed, my big takeaway was that a lot of the things that we think of as being very traditional and kind of set in stone for, for bridal um history are, are actually very new things. Yes. Uh, whereas all the stuff that we think we invented and is very hip and trendy uh, goes way back. <laughs> <laughs> so, so bridal fashion, uh, it, you know, the, the, the white dress, for example, Queen Victoria really popularized it. She wasn't the first to wear it, but being the queen, you know, she had a big influence at making that popular, but it still didn't become the norm. Um, that was really something that only the, the most wealthy and fashionable sure. women wore. And even they would wear that white dress again and again. It wasn't a one-time use garment uh, like it might be today. Uh, it was really, I think, um, again, Hollywood that played a big part in uh, cha changing the wedding gown from something that was in line with current fashion to something very historical looking. Uh, but it's appropriate because uh, hi history and tradition is... Um, it, it, the history and tradition of, of weddings really leans on the fashion to give weddings the um, sort of the, the emotional heft that that they deserve. Uh, when you wear something that looks like you could have worn it a hundred years ago, you're saying, "I'm participating in a timeless ritual. My marriage is going to last forever." You know, you're you're dipping into a a longer history that says something about your values and and your intentions and I think wedding fashion um 
you know, it, it's not always uh, strictly in line with what we see on the runway, perhaps, but it does a lot of emotional labor, mm -hmm. uh, um, whether it's contemporary or something more historicized and kind of removed from, from uh, contemporary fashion. Interesting. And there's, um, we have quite a, the vignette of uh, bridal wear and, and wedding wear in our exhibit in, in Northern Threads part two. So for those of you that are in the audience that haven't had a chance to see that yet, um, you still have some time. The exhibit is going to, the last day to, to see the exhibit is December 31st. So you still get about a month. If you haven't had a chance to visit, uh, you still can in person. And if you go to mainhistory.org, uh, you can buy your tickets ahead of time, or you can see the exhibit virtually if you if you don't think you'll be able to make it there in person before it closes. What can you tell us about um, swimming skirts through the decades? <laughs> swimming skirts. Yeah, um, swimming skirts and swimming socks. Uh, that's that's another uh, thing I'd like to learn more about. Um, in you know, the 20s, you didn't just wear a little skirt on your swimsuit, you wore socks because you didn't want your bare legs to show. <laughs> so you sort of had over the knee socks. Uh, and you wore these in the water, um, often with little lace up ballet shoes too. Uh, yeah, so it, again, swimming fashion has traditionally followed uh, the the line of a fashion we wear every day, just just like armor uh, has a lot to do with the cut and the silhouette of what's fashionable for everyday wear. And uh, skirts, um, you know, if you if you look at a Victorian bathing suit, you don't see any skin at all. By the twenties, you could show a little bit of leg, just as you could with your your dresses, but you were still wearing stockings. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it the idea of what we can show um, is very much tied to what we show every day. Really fascinating stuff. Thank you so much. This was such a great uh, talk and great discussion. And uh, thank you to our audience for having um, for having such great questions. The book is Skirts. You can get your copy uh, through Maine Historical Society. I shared the link in the chat, but our online store is mainhistorystore.com or you can visit us in person Tuesday through Saturday at 489 Congress Street. Um, Kimberly, again, thank you so much. Is there anything else you wanted to, I'll give you the last word to say or share before we go. <laughs> Uh, buy, buy my books. <laughs> it is a great, it is a great book. Um, you know, I read it in anticipation of our talk and just I found it really fascinating, um, and a really enjoyable read. So I, uh, I hope everyone will buy it. Present. Yes. And, yeah. Uh, a great Christmas present. If you have a, a man in your life who has interest in history and fashion, I really recommend the, um, my book worn on this day which covers some of the same territory, but has a bit more, um, you know, uniform and, and uh, bloodstained garments in it and, and is great for a, a general history buff. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you again. And uh, thank you to our audience. Um, take care. Hope we'll see you uh, real soon. And uh, Kimberly, please uh, stay in touch and let us know what you're working on. I'd be happy, Kathleen. Hope to get out to um Portland again soon and yes yes yeah let us know when you're in town and we'd love to see you at MHS